we're going to move on to thinking about thinking computationally or computational thinking. And computational thinking, along with spatial thinking, along with geographic thinking, along with all the domain ways of thoughts and ways of doing, they're all essential parts of doing GIS. I don't think that a, a GIS course or a GIS uh, series of module playlists on YouTube is complete without considering computational thinking. And we're going to think about all parts of this brain here. Uh, I've got the link to this brain later on in the slides, but it's uh, from the BBC. And it is so vital for us learning GIS or doing GIS to take into account and to remember and to consider all of the different ways of doing that we're operating with in the GIS space. So from Carnegie Mellon, computational thinking is a way of solving problems, designing systems, and understanding human behavior that draws on concepts fundamental to computer science to flourish, flourish, good word. In today's world, computational thinking has to be a fundamental part of the way people think and understand the world. I will break all those rules that say don't read your PowerPoint slides for this one. because you could substitute GIS spatial thinking into this and be just as correct. Spatial thinking and computational thinking are intricately linked, especially within GIS, because you are often doing them both at the same time, but especially because the practice of doing GIS, the actions, the maneuvers, the manipulations are embedded in computational and spatial thought. We don't conduct an analysis without thinking about the spatial relationships that we're trying to understand and also the computational linkages that we're trying to create. We don't think about computing process or workflow without also thinking about the spatial representations therein. So all of this should sound familiar to anyone who has done GIS and maybe not engaged with computational thinking directly. And I kind of wager, if you could bet on pedagogy, I don't know, somewhere you can do that, I'm sure, that someone who does computational work would recognize in GIS those computational aspects, even if it was being presented just spatially. So, I mean, you can think of it as kind of a, a network, right? There's spatial work being done spatially. There's spatial work being done computationally. There's computational work being done computationally, and there's computational work being done spatially. We'll skip adding geographic thinking in there because I don't have enough space in my brain to think about that grid. I Plenty of discussions could be had on the differences and similarities between spatial and geographic thinking. But once again, it's not that kind of class. It's not that kind of playlist. There's your brain. Your computational thinking brain. And as I said, this is from the BBC. Some of their breakdown on what computational thinking means for aspects. These are broadly agreed upon in the computer science education literature. Decomposition, abstraction, pattern recognition, and algorithms. We're gonna run through these and see what's up. And we're gonna be thinking about them in connection to GIS. So decomposition. We do this all the time with basically everything. Taking a complex problem, or system and breaking it down into smaller parts, easier and more manageable to understand. We do this all the time. Make a to-do list. Decomposition. You're breaking down the problem of your day into smaller parts. Making a workflow. Trying to figure out what part of the vacuum cleaner is broken and not cleaning anymore. We want to take something complex and difficult 
and break it down into smaller parts. We constantly do this to make our lives more manageable. We certainly do this in GIS to make our analysis more manageable. Every lab activity is decomposed because every lab activity contains many parts and you have to break it down into smaller pieces to be able to understand what is being asked of you and what you need to do. From there, think of pattern recognition, finding similarities among our problems. If you solved a problem a certain way once and you have a similar problem, it's logical to continue that you might solve that similar problem a similar way. Making that connection between problems or examples of different types and then relating them together, relating them to different components, relating them to different pieces, so on and so on, saves you time and energy. You don't have to remake a problem from scratch when you already have a solution for something similar. In, in computer programming or computer science, we might think of that just as the copy and paste, you copy and paste some code, fix the variables and we'll be good to go. Well, in GIS, same idea. Well, well, the last time I had this problem with trying to understand how far things were from other things, I did a buffer uh, and I, did X, Y, and Z, and I need to understand how things are from other things, but I need this other attribute with them. I bet I can change a setting. I bet I can change the same process. As we understand patterns, we can then work on generalizing. So uh, we're back to the BBC example here. All cats have attributes. Tails, eyes, fur nibbliness. And if you can find the pattern of what a cat looks like, what a cat is doing, then you can start to define specifics. This cat has a long fluffy tail. This cat has green eyes and bites. This pattern identification then allows us to understand what is happening between different problems and within individual problems, allows us to understand common features and seek out common processes. Pattern identification then allows us to begin that generalization idea to, to generalize our approaches and to determine how different components operate and where they differ, right? Without some kind of pattern ID, without some kind of pattern recognition, We're stuck redoing the same thing over and over. We want to learn and understand where these similar similarities exist so that we can more readily solve problems. And then as we filter those components out, as we start to establish, oh, this is this type of problem, this is this type of problem, as we decompose something into generalized steps for processing or generalized steps for working with, then we can start abstracting our components. Concentrating on the parts of the problems that matter, the parts of the analysis that we have to deeply consider and start working on making the rest more practical, more automated in a way more part of our daily general sense of function.
we create representations of what we want to create, to solve, to see. which then function as more generalized, but perhaps more attainable goals. This reduction in complexity lets us focus on process. So we can kind of set specific issues aside, specific details, and instead scale up, there's that magic scale word again, and say, okay, the process to solve this is going to involve these steps. Then you can zoom down and kind of say, okay, within this step, I have to really figure out why this line of data isn't working or this line of code or this field of my attributes. Abstraction gives us a reduced complexity so that we can work forward and integrate the details later. For example, have a cake. Love a cake. Personally, I love a good baking show or food competition. And if you're watching Bake Off or Iron Chef or anything else, you will note that people who have experience, people who have practiced things a lot, are flexible in ways that if you don't have that practice can seem kind of jarring. The Food Network show Chopped is a great example of this. Make a thing with these four random, random components. Iron Chef with the secret ingredient. Take off with the technical challenge. All are relying on chefs or bakers' practices, their experience, their skills, but also their ability to decompose a problem, understand the steps, to find patterns from what they've done before and apply them here, to abstract it. So it's making a cake. And a cake has ingredients, and you put those ingredients together in a certain order, and then you bake the cake. That's cake baking. We don't need to know what the ingredients are, what the quantity is, how long to bake it for. We just need to know that it needs to be done. And then we can use our experience from previous cake adventures to guide us. And when things go wrong, we can fix it. We've established a process for making a cake. And what is that if not an algorithm? Some kind of step-by-step -step instructions or techniques or outlets to get us from the beginning to the end. GIS is nothing if not a process, a workflow. And in that, it is incredibly computational. The difficult step, the hard part, is chaining all of those together. But every piece along the way, every lab exercise, every lecture, every help documents, every article on someone's new deployment of GIS is a step in building up those skills and practices. And there are plenty of resources out there. These are just some very basic ones. You might imagine that Google's very interested in computational thinking. And I'm sure that if you did a quick Google search on the YouTubes here, you would find even more computational thinking supports. So it doesn't just have to be you crawling around without a without a clue, without a way of understanding, without anything like that. 
Instead, you can work and you can think and you can operate computationally within GIS. And in doing GIS, you're already embracing that computational side. 